in, of course, Americans expect their law to be obeyed. And, of course, what happened, it doesn't actually say, oh, you must obey the law and get on with it. They had a court case, a very important court case in 1803 called Marbury versus Madison. And in it, two laws came into conflict. One was constitutional and one was just made by Congress. And Chief Justice Marshall declared that in any such conflict between the Constitution and a law passed by Congress, the Constitution must always take precedence. Well, that's obviously the logic and the natural thinking that you would expect of it, isn't it? But it's never happened. We've never had a Marbury versus Madison in this country. We have never actually, there are court cases that you can read, and probably the most recent one was the fox hunting case, in which there was just about mention that possibly, that possibly the law lords could actually overturn an act of parliament. Well, surely if you've got constitution, uh, you ultimately need redress and remedy. And sure, the act shouldn't get through in the first place, but if they do, then surely we ought to be able to go peaceably to our courts and get them declared void. Um, and that is something that hasn't happened here, but did happen in America, and that is the only reason that the American uh, Constitution uh, is so revered by their people, simply because they have had uh, such a court case. Now, of course, there is a right of petition. We have a right of petition here to the Crown, and the Americans copied that bit too. So, because that's a bit that connects them with their constitution, to petition the government for redress of grievance. Um, and that, of course, uh, comes out of uh, the Magna Carta as well. Here we are, we come through to 1930s, and uh, a very astute man called Lord Hewitt of Berry was our Lord Chief Justice. And he wrote a book, as a sitting Lord Chief Justice, called The New Despotism. And chapter four, believe it or not, was called Administrative Lawlessness. Well, coming from a Lord Chief Justice, to see something like that didn't go down so well. Uh, anyway, that uh, manifested itself in a committee sitting called the Committee of Ministers' Powers. Um, that had upset the balance of things, and so they thought, well, we better, better see what he's complaining about. And indeed they did, and this report, the Ministers' Powers report, is important um, because it decided um, what were the rightful powers of ministers. As up to that time, what had been going on is that they'd started, after the, particularly after the First World War, putting clauses into Acts of Parliament saying, you're the minister of a department minister, and therefore you may have uh, transport under your command or whatever it is, uh, agriculture, fisheries, food, whatever, all those things. Um, but you can make the rules and regulations for your department. And the rules, this is an enabling act, giving you authority to make the rules, and you can sit at the tribunal as in the final arbiter of it. And so, of course, this was all, of course, subordinate to the true rule of law. This was creating an administrative system. And uh, Hewitt said, well, actually, what you're doing is licensing lots of despots um, in the form of the ministers themselves and their systems. And it was a very good bit of text in the beginning of this uh, report. It's a very good report, and I'll just read it to you because it's a most remarkable bit of wording. The most distinctive indication of the change of outlook of the government of this country in recent years has been its growing preoccupation, irrespective of party, with the management of the life of the people. A study of the statute book will show how profoundly the conception of the public function of government has altered. Parliament finds itself increasingly engaged in legislation which has for its conscious aim the regulation of the day-to-day -day affairs of the community and now intervenes in matters formerly thought to be entirely outside its scope. This new orientation has its dangers as well as its merits. Between liberty and government, there is an age-long conflict. It is of vital importance that the new policy and there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. All this was was a change of policy. Right? While truly promoting liberty by securing better conditions of life for the people of this country should not, in its zeal for interference, deprive them of their initiative and independence, which are the nation's most valuable assets. Well, that was a passage from another report by Lord Macmillan. And I think you'll agree that there's a great deal of that that echoes today. And that was back in... 1929-1930. Uh, what happened is that the Minister of Power's report came in 1932 and it criticised uh, the way things were going 
and said that, look, if ministers are going to run departments, instead of them just making lots of rules and regulations, all these rules and regulations ought to be numbered and properly written down and to some extent approved by parliament, if not in a whole statutory format, um, we'll create something which they did called the statutory instrument. So now when a minister changes the rate of a license to be uh, enhanced because of inflation or something, they will probably issue a statutory instrument which will have a number and you can go back and find that statutory instrument XYZ 1234 um, has the authority or purports to give the parliamentary authority to the minister's change of what he's done. And of course statutory instruments may be challenged because now if, if a minister acts in creating statutory instruments beyond the scope of his office, then uh, he shouldn't do so. Um, so what we all see as the law mainly tends to be these administrative things. But actually the rule of law is, the, is beyond that. These are the administrative things. And the proof here comes on the actual creation of Statutory Instruments Act in 1946. And it says to repeal the Rules Publication Act, which was the only way rules uh, from uh, ordinances and prerogative rules were just published. Uh, and in order to um, go further than that, to create the statutory instruments and to make further provisions as to the instruments by which statutory powers to make orders, rules, regulations and other subordinate legislation are exercised. And so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, much of what we're talking about is recognized on the front of enactments as being entirely subordinate to the rule of law. Now, when the Queen gives her royal assent to an enactment, um, this is very interesting because, again, she doesn't rush down to sign the acts as people some think and, uh, in the Houses of Parliament or in the House of Lords. Um, she sends her cousins, they call it her cousins, and she does so by commissioning usually five of them um, to grant her royal assent to the acts. And so what happens is that she signs a, signs a letter patent, which this is a picture of, and you can see Her Majesty's signature at the top, and then at the bottom, unfortunately, it's a photocopy, but that would be the Great Seal of England um, on the bottom. It's a big red uh, uh, sealing wax seal, of course, with the Royal Seal, or the Seal of England. And what it says is that you commissioners can pronounce my royal assent when the two houses have agreed the full content of the enactments, um, and the enactments are listed on the schedule. Well, this schedule is rather important because the middle one of the three acts on that schedule happens to be the Re European Communities Act 1972. So that authority, that letter patent which the Queen has signed, gave her permission the royalists, uh, to her, uh, her, her cousins, in this case Lord Hailsham, um, to pronounce royal assent for the acts on the schedule. So it's that that transferred the power. And this is very interesting. Well, it doesn't transfer the power. The power recognizes the bill to become an enactment. And the text of the letter patent tells us the story. As set forth in the schedule here too, but the said acts are not of force or effect in law without our royal assent. Not of force or effect in law without our royal assent. So there you can see quite clearly where power lies. Power doesn't lie with the commons or the lords. The power is the people's power vested under contract in the crown. And here it is. And the crown gives its royal assent to measures which it approves. But clearly, it shouldn't approve unconstitutional measures. Well, talking about unconstitutional measures, um, prior to Lisbon Treaty, we had a constitution for Europe being offered us. And uh, Article 10, the constitution and law adopted by the union's institution in exercising competencies conferred on it, shall have primacy over the law of member states. Well, that's quite interesting, isn't it? How can it have primacy over our law? Um, anyway, that was an article. Of course, this was chucked out. It was revamped as the Lisbon Treaty. And uh, the Lisbon Treaty, of course, has got it in there that the competencies, the areas over which they can uh, have jurisdiction, if you look in the small print, you'll find they can define them. They can alter them. And, of course, the Constitution became the Lisbon Treaty. 